Hello, Guilty Feminists. This week, we are deep diving into an incredible episode, one of my favorites from May 2019, where we were honored to be invited to perform at the Science Museum. Our guests are Dr. Maggie Adarin Pocock and Dr. Anne Marie Imaphodon. There's a great conversation with Maggie, who often used to bring her baby on stage with her. I don't know if she still does, but I used to love that. It was a real show not tell about bringing kids to work and mothers working. Also a bit where Anne-Marie is talking about a scientist going on TV with a sexist shirt that I remember being brilliant and hilarious. As well as these two superstar scientists, I couldn't have asked for a better host than Sarah Pascoe, who's been with the podcast almost since the beginning and who has written her own books about science and the search for knowledge. I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed recording it. It really is a classic. I'm a feminist, but when I came in tonight to the Science Museum and saw that we were in the IMAX cinema... And that there was a picture of me on the screen that I wasn't expecting. (laughs) I realised I'd never seen quite as large a picture of me as that before. And I was very suddenly drawn to the birthmark on my neck, which in that picture is normally quite small and you wouldn't notice it. But when the picture is as big as a building, you suddenly go, oh God, there's my enormous birthmark on my neck. Which I should not be self-conscious about because every part of me is beautiful. But, but I grew up in Australia and quite often when I was a teenager, I would go into a shop and a man would go, mosquitoes are big round here. <laughs> and that would mean, I think that's a love bite on your neck. <laughs> and so that made me self-conscious because of course nobody had bitten my neck <laughs> and didn't bite my neck till many years after. <laughs> if to be honest, my neck has ever been bitten. <laughs> Maybe I should put it out for bite. No, (laughs) don't put that on Tinder. I wanted to have love bites when I was at school because it was just such a sign of being kind of sexually mature and in demand. And so I decided to give myself some love bites. But the only places I could reach were my lower arms. And I really, like, sucked on them for ages. (laughs) And then went back in and pretended I'd been on holiday. (laughs) And, like, met a guy called Jack. And he'd sucked your arms. (laughs) It's such a lower arm. The thing is, I thought I was such a good liar at school. Uh, Turns out, no. No. I'm a feminist, but I resent it when people assume that being a feminist means you hate men. I don't hate men. My boyfriend is a man. And by boyfriend, of course, I'm referring to the dildo I've made with the lopped-off cocks of my enemies. (laughs) I'm a feminist, but while I know that rock stars have a trick of looking out into the audience and kind of winking and making a thousand women feel winked at. I truly believe with all my heart, and you will never shake me of this belief, that Paul McCartney winked directly at me (laughs) at a concert in Sydney some years ago. If any rock star winked at you, I don't believe that happened. (laughs) And I know it happened to me. But I know it's a numbers game and it couldn't happen. Just go, hmm, if you've been seen from the stage by a rock star or pop star. Yeah, the numbers cannot add up. (laughs) Every woman thinks it's happened to her, but it hasn't. They just go in that direction, and they've just got this special power. But it did happen to me. He looked right at me. I was right at the front. I took my mum to see Michael Bolton for her birthday. We sat on the front row. I thought it was a nice birthday present. My mum, her body language changed the minute he came on stage. I knew something was wrong, and I kind of whispered, and she went, oh... Why has he cut his hair? And um, oh. she said, oh, I just, she just hadn't realised that he would have aged and she was very disappointed. And then she wanted us to leave. Um, but I, oh, no. But, but um, I said, we can't leave. We're right... At the, I mean, I, I have to perform to people. You can't leave right at the beginning no. of someone's show. It's so hurtful and horrible. So I said... And then there was a bit of a song where he went into the middle and got everyone to join in. And she went, he's got his back to us. Can we go now? And, oh, no. and then we left. Poor Michael Bolton. I didn't think I'd ever feel sorry for Michael Bolton, but I do. I don't feel sorry for him. He's the voice of an angel. Um, I'm a feminist, but sometimes I do enjoy being around sexists. Um, The the, the, the example I'm going to give you is a year ago, Deborah and I, it's very exciting, um, we went to Emma Thompson's party. I know! Yeah, I know. And um, and, and afterwards there was kind of, you know, like a smaller party after it was dwindling down and Emma Thompson had gone home and um, there was a man there and he was talking to us about comedy and he was saying, actually, there's this mistake that people make. They think it's harder for women in comedy. Actually, it's much easier because there's less of them. And then uh, Deborah, in a 
party mode, we're still kind of explaining, well, actually, there's very few places for women. So while there is statistically less of them, there's even less spaces for them. And then if you've got a few women, there's no space for new women to come up. So women still quit. And then he said, oh, God, you're not a feminist, are you? <laughs> he asked Deborah Francis White. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you're not, you're not a feminist, are you? <laughs> and I, I'm a feminist, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> Steve Ali had to like escort him out of the <laughs> out of the room. Like, okay, come on, Devs. I'm a feminist, but I was at a party the other night and Paul McCartney turned up. <laughs> Just walked in with his wife. And he talked to the host, but then you could see no one else really wanted to go up because he's too famous. So he was standing on his own in a kind of corner with his wife. And then I saw that Steve Ali. If you don't know who Steve Alley is, he lives in my spare room and he's a Syrian refugee. I've talked about him quite a lot on the podcast. He doesn't really have a strong read on how famous people are <laughs> because in Syria, his family were very religious, so he wasn't allowed to have any music, but also there was a lot of embargoes on Western media anyway. So the next thing I knew, Steve Alley was just chatting to Paul McCartney. <laughs> and I was like, oh. So I sort of sidled over because I thought, well, this is my inn, clearly. I want to see what a sidle looks like. I really have this image of you, like, kind of leaning back. I did. I just sort of did a sort of slight... You know when you sort of move two inches in this direction? Okay. And then two inches, and you just suddenly find yourself there. You're like, oh, hello, Paul. Oh, yeah. I did it like that. Yeah. I went, oh, hello, Paul. I haven't seen you for ages. And, uh, no, I didn't. I said, hello, Paul. I said, "Um, I'm Steve's friend. I thought they're, they're obviously bonded. I said, my name's Deborah. And I said, recently... A few weeks ago, I played Steve Hey Jude for the first time, and it was such an odd experience to play someone Hey Jude who hadn't heard Hey Jude, because you can't imagine anyone hasn't heard it, and I thought he would have heard it. He hadn't heard it. And it was such a remarkable thing to be able to share. And he said, yeah, he was just saying, you know, he's Syrian, and he said, you know, you read all of this about refugees, and every time you meet a refugee, they're just like us, and, you know, music brings everyone together, and, and he said, you know, really, you and Steve should come to a concert. 40,000 people singing Hey Jude, that's when you understand the power of music. And I said, well, funnily enough, Paul, (laughs) I've been to a concert of yours and uh, you winked at me. (laughs) And he said, oh yeah, I remember you. (laughs) And I said, look, I do always say, you know, a rock star can make everyone feel winked at, but I've always held on to it. And he took my hand in both of his hands and he looked right into my eyes and he said, no, I winked at you. (laughs) Never forget it. And I had my victory. I was right all of these years. Have you got another one? Um, yeah, but it's, I just, my last one, I've, I wrote, I'm a feminist, but I sometimes worry, like, oh, this shouldn't be fun being a feminist it should be really hard work maybe I'm not doing it properly and then I realised that what it is is that there were, there were lots of people who were very isolated doing feminism and they didn't have this like huge community and I'm not mm. saying we all think the same thing or agree there's lots of discussions going within it but it feels like such a massive thing that there isn't this like one pressure like you're the only person going please listen to me about something so um, and you're such a huge part of it Aww. so I just wanted to be very earnest thank you Sarah and so are you Ernest. the rest of you can leave we're going to make <laughs> yeah. out okay live from the science museum in london the spontaneity shop presents the guilty feminist with me deborah francis white guest co-host sarah pasco a very special guest dr maggie adaram pocock and dr anne marie in Mathedon, talking about women in science This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White and with me is Sarah Pascoe and we are talking about women in science. (laughs) Sarah, thank you so much for coming and doing this. Thank you so much for having me. I um, smell a bit. Um, I came straight, I thought it was a podcast, so it's all right. Um, uh, and you're far away. Yeah, I have um, started doing weight training. Oh. And um, I came straight from lifting weights. <laughs> and you look like you're sort of at the, out the other side of that now. Oh. Do you, are you feeling better since, from doing weight training? Oh, so much better. I had a massage the other day. Just bragging about how great my life is, guys. Um, and the masseuse says... Your back has the least knots I've ever touched. <laughs> what is your secret? In any human? Yeah, she was basically wow. saying, 
you've won at massage. She's like, wow. you're back. At, she's like, you don't need one. And I was like, oh, I was just bored. Uh, I thought I'd pay someone to rub me. And Because um, <laughs> I feel that since I've started yoga, yeah. I massage myself. Yeah, so if I really inside. need a massage, I go to yin. Yeah. Because it's a lot cheaper and also more satisfying to do it yourself. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, I yeah. feel convinced about that. So yeah. there you go, sports science. Yeah. Before we've even begun. Everything. Before we've even begun. I feel your shows always have such a heavy science element. You do so much research for them and your book as well. I really, I think the really great thing about stand up is that whatever you're learning about or thinking about or experiencing feeds into your work. And I'm really lucky that post university, I love reading, some people don't. And I try and always alternate non fiction and fiction. And science just became this great interest for me after school. My mum, interestingly, has a PhD in genetics, but she left school with no GCSEs. So I think my childhood, I was really influenced by my mum's wanting to understand things. So you've now become a curious grown-up yes. post-school. I think yeah. that's true of a lot of us. Yeah. I feel like I'm a more curious grown-up than I was at school, where I just wanted to get the right answers and get my homework done. I was interested, but I'm now a lot more interested yes. because I think I know how it relates to the real world. Well, that's it. You get to pick and choose what is applicable to you and what fascinates you rather than someone else deciding you're going to read Lord of the Flies. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> And that will be imposed upon you. In Australia, I was, there were always these really long... They tried to make you read Australian literature. Oh, what's the Australian literature you had to do at school? Oh, my Fortunate Life. And it was about a man who had a really unfortunate life. <laughs> Just awful, lived in the outback. Everything was dreadful. It was called Fortunate Life because he was looking at from a perspective of a man who thought he was lucky because, I don't know, he hadn't died or something. Um, just terrible, wow. terrible, terrible, yeah. endlessly long books yeah. about Australia because there was this feeling that we shouldn't just be reading English literature, we yeah, should be British literature, we should be reading, or American literature, yeah. we should be reading Australian literature. But it, was, it was before Leanne Moriarty, before it got fun. <laughs> well before. Well before. Um, you've got a pup I've got down a dog here. today. <sighs> yeah, no. It's a pup, it's as small as a teacup. I've only seen it in pictures. A really big teacup. One, um, one, a patch over its eye, not... Not like a pirate, like in its markings. I'll, if you all leave your phone numbers, I'll text you on a picture. Um, yeah, he's super Can cute. you put a picture on Instagram? Cause that's it's on actually, Instagram already. Well, that's probably a better thing than texting them individually. That's what Instagram he, he, is. He's had, he's had over 8,000 likes already. Has he? Yeah. Well, he should have more because he's just the best thing ever. And his name's Mouse? Mouse. Yeah, I'm yeah. so excited. He looks like a mouse. He's got, um, he's got whiskers above his eyes. You like, you know what men get when they're about 35? <laughs> and they start to have those really long ones. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> they could trim them. We oh, would have oh, to. I wasn't saying it was an unsolvable problem. No. I actually, but, I actually think but it's But adorable. the patriarchy would tell women, trim them. Maybe women do get them, but we don't know because women trim them. Oh, I see. You see what I mean? Yeah. Because the patriarchy would force us with its clippers. <laughs> Everybody, please, will you welcome to the microphone, it's Deborah Francis White! <laughs> So I'm reading from my book, The Guilty Feminist, Sunday Times bestseller. Don't go on about it, though. There's no need. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't bought a copy, they'll be available in the foyer, and I'll sign it for you. But I'm going to read a bit from it. This is a part about quotas. What people forget when they get angry about quotas is that there's always been quotas. It's just that historically, quotas have been 100% male. There was a quota for voting in this country. Up until 100 years ago, it was 100% male. So now when we're saying, could we please have one woman on the board or could we aim for 30% you know, women in this or that industry or you know, could, could anyone on the board of directors have met a woman? Um, <laughs> could we introduce them to one just so they could identify one if needed? Um, they get all cross, like, oh, it's unfair. You just want the best person for the job. And I would argue that you definitely don't have that. Because if you've got 100% or 90% men, then you are experiencing the legacy of the old quota system. And that's why you need a new quota system. And then I'm talking about how that intersects with other sorts of oppression. It is important for us as feminists, whether radical, liberal, guilty or otherwise, to recognise that women as a group aren't on a level playing field any more than men and women are. The history of American patents is a great place to get some insight on the interplay between race and gender because innovators are leaders in their field and patent officers keep excellent records. 
On the 31st of July, 1790, Samuel Hopkins was the first person to be issued a US patent. It was for a process of making potash, an ingredient used in fertilizer, and the patent was signed by President George Washington. 19 years later, Mary Kyes became the first woman to receive a patent for her method of weaving straw with silk in 1809. 12 years later, the first African-American to receive a patent was Thomas L. Jennings for innovative dry cleaning equipment in 1821. 63 years later, the first African-American woman claimed a patent, Judy W. Reed, for an improved dough kneader in 1884. When I first wrote this list, I did not notice that I had described these individuals as the first person, the first woman, the first African-American, and the first African-American woman, because that is how they are listed in the history books. The further away you are from being a white man, the less you are seen by society as being a neutral person. That is pretty devastating, isn't it? In fact, this is a list of the first Caucasian-American man, the first Caucasian-American woman, the first African-American man, and the first African-American woman to be granted a patent. And everything about our environment makes it easy to forget that. It is significant that while Samuel Hopkins is to be found on sites about patents, Mary Keyes is usually referenced in lists of historical women. Thomas L. Jennings can only be found in resources about African Americans, and I read about Judy W. Reed in an article entitled Uncovering History's Black Women Inventors, because depressingly, uncovering is almost always required to find the achievements of women of color. Innovators and leaders who are not white men live in the margins of history and the specialist sections of the library. You will also notice that the first white woman was included in the inventor's process a full 75 years before the first woman of color. This is an anecdotal example, but one that's part of a pattern. White women are often included before and instead of men of color, but men of color are usually included before and instead of women of color. Feminism is a fight for equality, so we've got to notice when the power gap benefits us if we are white, straight, cis, or non-disabled, or a combination of any of these as well as when it fails us. Which leads me on to Madam C.J. Walker. Sarah Breedlove was an African-American born in 1867 and the first person in her living family to be born free from slavery. After being orphaned at the age of seven, she went to work in a cotton field and to live with her sister and abusive brother-in-law. She married at 14, had a baby at 18, and was widowed at 20. She started working as a laundress and cook and raised her daughter on $1.50 a day. At the age of 35, she was tired, overworked, had left her second unfaithful husband, and to add to her troubles, she was losing her hair. Her great-granddaughter later wrote, During the early 1900s, when most Americans lacked indoor plumbing and electricity, bathing was a luxury. As a result, Sarah and many other women were going bald because they washed their hair so infrequently, leaving it vulnerable to environmental hazards such as pollution, bacteria, and lice. In 1904, she discovered a product designed by another orphaned African-American woman whose parents had also been enslaved and whose father had fought for the Union in the Civil War. Annie Turnbow, who had studied chemistry at school, had created a product for hair, called The Wonderful Hair Grower, which really worked, and Sarah began to market and sell it. She started to develop her own hair products, working with her brothers who were barbers. Around this time, she married C.J. Walker and built her brand, Madame C.J. Walker. Madame had a French cachet that was respected in the cosmetics industry. Taking her husband's first and last names, boldly rejected the disrespectful convention of white people referring to black women by their first names or the dismissive and loaded term auntie. The husband didn't last long, but she kept the name. It was a courageous act of parasite feminism. Parasite feminism, I've discussed earlier in the book, is when you, as a feminist, get on the back of the patriarchy, you are a tick, it is a dog, you bleed it dry. Madam C.J. Walker's critics complained that her hair straightening products encouraged black women to aspire and conform to white beauty standards, which was a fair concern. But she countered that she'd had a divinely inspired dream featuring a black man who gifted her the formula and that some of the ingredients were from Africa. She maintained that her potions couldn't be less white. They were saving women from pain and baldness and they were from God and Africa. The divine dream defense 
Um, I have talked about this earlier in the book. This is something women have done throughout the ages, right back to Julian of Norwich. When women weren't listened to and when women were not meant to be in certain spheres, they'd go, oh, just had a dream last night. It was really divine. God told me I should come and tell you this. And then people who were very religious, that they were scared that if they burnt this woman or told her to go away or locked her up, that God would be angry with them. So the divi- watch for the divine dream in history. The divine dream defense was there for motivated the divine dream defense was there for motivated defiant women throughout the ages. Madam CJ Walker's opening investment was $1.25. She is said to be the first self-made female millionaire in the United States of America. Some people dispute this and say that it was in fact her original supplier and eventual business rival Annie Turnbow. Either way, they got there before any white woman. It's probable that Walker's fortune didn't reach a million dollars, but to paraphrase Oscar Wilde, to become a millionaire is nothing, but to make people think one has done it when one hasn't is a triumph. In today's money, Walker's fortune probably amounted to about $8 million. This was a virtually impossible achievement in a landscape in which African Americans couldn't get bank loans or join trade unions. Most black people were stuck in menial jobs and poverty for life. One of the only ways out was to be an entrepreneur in a market that was segregated by the Jim Crow laws. White-owned corporations rarely catered to black people's needs. Hair care was the perfect way to create a flourishing business. Madam C.J. Walker became a philanthropist in the African-American community and contributed $1,000 to the YMCA, which was a very large donation at that time, about 24000 and the largest ever from a black woman at that time. She was making waves and decided that she wanted to attend the National Negro Business League Convention in 1912. She turned up ready to speak, but Booker T. Washington, the founder of the League and one of the most powerful black leaders of the era, was not interested. He didn't respect her or her products. Her response to this was a hard no. No, she would not be silenced and excluded. She'd worked her way up to being one of the most successful entrepreneurs in America in a segregated, white-dominated world. She refused to be silenced within her own community because of misogynoir. On the last day of the conference, while Booker T. Washington was addressing the audience from the stage, she stood up and announced, "'Surely you are not going to shut the door in my face. "'I am a woman who came from the cotton fields of the South. "'I was promoted to the wash tub. "'From there, I was promoted to the kitchen. "'And from there, I promoted myself "'into the business of manufacturing hair goods and preparations. "'I have built my own factory on my own ground.'" Washington was shocked and angered and refused to give Madam CJ a platform, but she had got to him. She continued to do more for the YMCA. She also contributed to an institute of higher learning for African Americans that Booker himself had established. In 1913, Booker could see she was not going to take no for an answer and invited her to the NNBL convention as a keynote speaker. She once said, America doesn't respect anything but money. What our people need is a few millionaires. Her motives weren't personal. They were social, racial, and feminist. I am not merely satisfied in making money for myself, for I am endeavoring to provide employment for hundreds of women of my race. And I want to say to every one of them, don't sit down and wait for the opportunities to come. Get up and make them. I got my start by giving myself a start. Madam C.J. Walker is another one of my favorite guilty feminists from history. She made her money on hair care products and makes my hair stand on end whenever I read about her. She was the first person to use before and after shots, which is definitely more guilty than feminist. (laughs) She said no to society's view of who she was allowed to be based on her race, gender, and economic start in life. She created her own boundaries and never allowed a man to impose his limitations on her, even when he had the microphone, and she just had her voice. She is the human embodiment of the power of no. Thank you. Hello, Guilty Feminists. This is Deborah. We're recording more live episodes and you can come and see us at Soho Theatre on the 18th and 19th of August. 18th of August will be a one-on-one chat with me and award-winning journalist Yomi Adekake, who wrote Slay in Your Lane. And it's about her new book, The List, which is totally fascinating. It's about a couple who are about to get married and then an anonymous list comes out on the internet saying that various men are predators or abusers in some way and our lead character's fiancé is mentioned on the list. It's got so many twists and turns and it's a real analysis of where we are right now in society and the internet. 
it's so beautifully handled and managed and nuanced and thought provoking. It's one of the best novels I've read uh, in many years. And I really, really hope you can come because Yomi is honestly one of my favourite people in the world. I'm not just saying that, I mean it. Um, that's the 18th of August, uh, but we're also there on the 19th of August. We are live in Chichester on the 21st of August, where we'll be talking to the cast of my new play, Never Have I Ever. You can also see my new play, Never Have I Ever, if you can get to Chichester in September. It's starring Susan McComa, Greg Wise, Alexandra Roach and Amit Shah and is being directed by the incredible Emma Butler. And we're recording episodes of The Guilty Feminist and Global Pillage at the London Podcast Festival on Saturday the 16th and Sunday the 17th of September. For tickets to any of these, go to guiltyfeminist.com and click on live shows. Except if you want to go to the play, and then I want you to go to cft.org.uk. You can also get ad-free episodes via Patreon, Apple Podcasts, or Acast Plus. And if you're passing iTunes or Spotify and you felt like leaving us a five-star review, we'd love you forever. It really does help people find the podcast, as does subscribing or following. And now, back to the podcast. Our first guest today is the founder of Science Innovation Limited. She did her PhD next door at the Imperial. Uh, <laughs> She was born a Londoner, and so the Science Museum inspired her to be a scientist. She has been a presenter of BBC Sky at Night and Stargazing and is now doing a new television show for children, and she has an MBE. Joining her is the founder of STEM Etz. She had A-levels at the age of 11, scarily. Um, she'd finished her master's at Oxford by the time she was 20, annoyingly. <laughs> She is now doing a social enterprise project to help young women, girls as young as five and young women to 21, to get into science. Uh, she runs fun and food-filled events, and she's now starting a podcast uh, for women in tech. So please, welcome to the stage uh, two women we are very, very honoured to have, Dr. Maggie Adaran pocock and Dr. Anne-Marie Imaphodon. So Maggie, I met you at an event years ago, but I don't know if you remember me. So what happened was I was hosting a corporate away day for Accenture for the International Women's Day and you were a very honoured guest keynote speaker. I'll never forget it because you just walked onto the stage with your baby and normally at these events they have someone come on to do a presentation that I call Why I'm Better Than You and Always Will Be. And <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a woman who's, you know, a senior partner in the business and she'll sort of say, well, of course, when I first had Sebastian, it was quite challenging, but the maternity leave package here is so wonderful and I found with, you know, with the right amount of nannies, it was all possible. <laughs> And do you know, you cannot underestimate the power of a breast pump at your desk. Keep it at your desk. And what you did is you didn't tell us, you just showed us, you just brought your baby onto the stage. You never explained that you had a baby. You didn't need to, we could see that you had a baby. <laughs> the evidence was there. But, yeah, but you just showed us what it was to be a mother at work. And you gave this amazing keynote and half the way through the baby got a bit fractured. So you just handed her to me without saying a word. And I thought, oh, well, I've got a baby now. Um, <laughs> Then a lady came up the aisle and took her from me. And then you came off the stage and you said, where's my baby? And I said, <laughs> you do. And I you said do. your nanny took her. And you said, I don't have a nanny. <laughs> and I realised I'd given your baby to a random lady. <laughs> and you said, oh, don't worry. I find there's always someone who'll take a baby at these things. And do you know what? I knew that you'd found her because next time I saw you was at the Inspirational Women Awards. Oh. And you came back onto the stage to collect an award for a TV show with the same baby. So I was relieved. Are you sure? It's a lucky baby. <laughs> you know, I was relieved. So, you know, I just got a supply, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Uh, but it seemed like the same baby, but it was a year and a half older. And this baby was so, had been raised on stage and at work. And when you got the award, as you left the stage, your baby waved like the queen. <laughs> Because she was so used to being on stage, she just went like this. It was the sweetest thing I'd ever seen. But I thought, this baby is, she's being raised at work. And she 
100% has this bond with her mother, but she knows that her mother works because she comes along. And I just wanted to say how much that impressed me, that you are showing us the way you're not telling us. How, how is she now? She's eight now. Um, I've, I've got a picture of her on my phone. And she's a bit of a diva, though, because um, she has travelled the world with me. And um, by the time she was four years old, she'd done over 100 flights. And I made the fake mistake once that we were coming back from Australia and we came back business class. We did it because the next day we were flying to Croatia and we flew EasyJet. And so she, you know, she got into the plane and said, Mummy, where's my, my sort of um, my cinema? <laughs> and, uh-huh. We'll be coming round with the canapes. <laughs> no, love, this is EasyJet. You know? uh-huh. <laughs> That's a reality. <laughs> Excellent. So she's a first class baby, really, isn't she? She's a first class baby, which is absolutely amazing. And Anne Marie, I met you at the Inspirational Women Awards, and I thought, you know, I've, I've made it. I've been invited to these awards. Yeah. Obviously, I'm inspirational. And then the lady sitting next to me said, just to be clear, you are never going to win an award, and neither am I. She went, the women who win these awards are so incredible that when you hear what they've done, you just go, oh, well, no, I'm not in this league. <laughs> And she was right. She was absolutely right. I went to the loo at halftime and everyone in the loo was looking a bit shell-shocked. And we all said the same thing, which was we were equally inspired and intimidated by the women who'd won the awards because some of them had, like, stopped a genocide or something. And I was like, oh, shit, I've got a podcast, you know. (laughs) And one of the women who won was Anne-Marie for starting STEMETS. And when they introduced you, they were like, oh, she was a child prodigy who'd, you know, written Symphony by the age of three and then discovered a new country by the age of eight and then <laughs> now you run STEMETS and the reason you got the award is you hadn't just gone oh great well I'm brilliant you were bringing up a whole generation of young women behind you which is just the most inspirational thing what's funny about that is I've been to that lunch before for the two years before and the winners of those are incredible women but the two years I've been they're women who had done things that were so incredible they made you cry and so my thing coming back this year was I can't possibly ever win any of these because nothing I do makes anybody cry. It makes them laugh and they just make technology and they enjoy themselves. And so I couldn't believe it when the email came in. I was like, gosh, there must be more yeah. people out there that you could have given this to that make people cry. Um, no, and so I was really though. worried because then when I stood up, people were then laughing um, <laughs> at, at me, with me, whatever. No, um, you were funny. You, you were one of the, I think, the only one who made jokes during your speech. But some of the others had, like one of those ladies, she had stopped a genocide. <laughs> she had, and yeah. She, argue with she can't make jokes. doesn't make good material. I'm, I'm having horrible flashbacks. So to be really shallow... I was once asked to do stand-up at these awards, guys, and um, it wasn't a paid gig. Basically, a charity called Shelter, who are amazing, and I do work with sometimes, they said, we can get sponsorship on the boards if we bring a guest who's going to, like an entertainer. And I didn't know anything about the awards or the crying. And so um, all of these awards were people, they were all dying. These people were all like, well, I found out I had three months to live and all I wanted to do was give all of that time creating wedding dresses for other women who are dying who want to get married. It was like that, and everyone's just weeping, and it's so sad, and people are so brave and so incredible. And then I had to go up and do jokes. Oh, 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 how how are you all doing? Oh, God. (laughs) Everyone in from America. Wonder bras. (laughs) Oh, they're annoying. They're annoying, aren't they? Um, (laughs) The oyster card. Why is it called an oyster card? Um, <laughs> you, that's, yeah, that's one of my bits. <laughs> my my really Oyster card bit. One, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what I'm saying is, is I'm in awe of both of you. I've heard from women in science that it's one of the most male-dominated, most difficult areas to work in, and I say that as a woman in comedy. If you watch Mock the Week, you know our work environment and our chances of career advancement limited, but. I've heard that science is a tough terrain. What's good about it? What's tough about it? I think it, when you say science, because if you take STEM in general, there are some areas which I think we should be celebrating. Uh, you were mentioning that you know, for a long time, uh, the status quo was all doctors should be male. But now more women are going into medicine than men. Mm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, I, I, I think the first woman doctor was, I think, in 1865. She received mm. their doctorate. She's in, 1865. in my book. Oh, yes. Elizabeth Garrison. So, so if you look at, we've come, it hasn't been fast, but we have come a long way if more women are going into. And if you look at biology and various subjects, but it's as you sort of go down the rankings. If you get, when you get to physics, you're sort of you're about you know, 70, 30 <laughs> physics. <laughs> and understanding of everything in the universe, you can't get better than that. Anyway, I'm slightly biased. <laughs> so then, then you're sort of you're 70, 30. 
But by the time you get to sort of uh, computing, it's sort of, you know, sort of you know, computing good stuff. But yeah, the numbers are sort of 10%, 90%. And engineering the same. So it's sort of so... Um, en- engineering is worse than computing, I should just say. Just to throw <laughs> yeah, as a I'm, female I'm engineer, I am yeah. rare. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the areas we need to target. So we have come a long way in some subjects, but there's still some areas which we need to get better. There's something happens with comedy and women being underrepresented, and I wonder if it's the same, is where sometimes a lot of the theories about why women aren't represented are really unhelpful. Like, even asking the question is kind of compounding lots of kind of assumed truths. Yes. Is I think same? it's the same. Yeah. I think one of the assumed truths is, oh, well, you know, girls just aren't really into that sort of thing. But it turns out that if you look at the statistics in a subject like physics, girls actually do better in physics. I always put it down to sort of internal barriers and external barriers. And it turns out that sort of some girls think, oh, well, you know, physics is you know, a good subject. You know, I'm quite good at it. But you'd have to be a genius you know, to really study physics. And we're told from an early age that, well, I mean, you were a genius. Yes, you were a genius. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're told to from an early now. age that, you know, that's not for them. We did a, this video and it showed sort of uh, girls in schools and they had sort of you know, famous scientists on the walls and he sort of panned across. And it was uh, the great and the good of the science. So there was Stephen Hawking, yeah, there was Newton. There was Professor Bunsen from the Muppets. They didn't have one woman up there. They had a Muppet, no <laughs> women. <laughs> they literally had a Muppet. <laughs> And so the girls were saying, well, women just don't do physics. So, so, and also, the other one was, OK, if you study physics, you can only be a physics teacher. Because I couldn't see it in the reality. What else can you be if you do <laughs> physics? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, OK, um, I've got a degree in physics and a PhD in mechanical engineering. And so far, I've worked for the MOD. I do children's television and grown-up TV. Uh, I've written some books. I'm working on a drama series for Sky One as a, a science consultant. Oh, um, yeah, I've done missile warning systems. Yeah, there's quite a bit out there. Yeah, that's <laughs> It's similar to a performing arts A level. It's very similar. <laughs> it's flexible. <laughs> it is. I think that's what you. And many people do physics and then go into work in the city. So, but I think that's the problem. If they don't get the exposure, they don't realise the diversity of things. And as I say, physics is the understanding of the universe. So, it is it out there? <laughs> what made you want to be a scientist when you were a child, Maggie? Okay, it's a little embarrassing, but um, I became a scientist um, mainly because of the clangers. I don't know if you remember. I've even bought so, so this is like clanger, but uh, yeah. So they weren't toys. wrong to have a muppet on the wall then. <laughs> that is inspiring. Well, <laughs> yeah, um, actually, it was, um, the clangers and also um, the moon landings. This year we're celebrating fifty years since the moon landings, and yeah, there's Star Trek as well. You know, live long and prosper. <laughs> it was all that sort of thing. I love science fiction because I suffer from dyslexia, and so I wasn't very good at reading. And I was in the remedial class when I was at school and I went to 13 different schools so I moved around a lot but science fiction just told me and, and Lieutenant Yohora whoa I, I so wanted to be Lieutenant Yohora I have the uniform at home but I, 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 don't, I don't wear it in public it's just not right <laughs> so yeah you so, could have worn it tonight actually what you are wearing is a space corset if people are listening at home you're wearing uh, a most corset thing I've ever seen. with constellations on it. <laughs> and light up stars. <laughs> light up stars on it and a sort of tutu dress skirt. It's Sky incredible. Skirt. I was actually at a, um, a film premiere earlier. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. And so this isn't for us, this is a film <laughs> premiere. Well, no, no, of course this is for... Although it's a podcast, so no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at a film premiere. And I so just I thought, oh my like... God, she's so glamorous. <laughs> I, I wear this all the time. <laughs> Did you want to be an astronaut when you were a child? I heard someone else say, yes. Somebody <laughs> said, you, the audience she, know you. They're like, yes, she did. Well, she, no, 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 I still do. This has been the driving force throughout my life. Um, as a child, that's what really got me excited because um, I wanted to go out into space. I've always wanted to go out there. The only time I had a sort of slight wobble was when my daughter was born. Um, mm. All my life, I've had this crazy dream of getting out into space. I was trying to find ways of doing it. But when my daughter was born, I thought, OK, it's more of a retirement plan now. And so my daughter, um, sometimes she says that she wants to be a space artist. So I'm a space scientist. She's a space artist. And we're going to zoom out there together, dragging my husband with us. <laughs> zoom out there together and sort of just cover everything, really. <laughs> wow. So you had 30 different schools. 13, when, yes. when you said you wanted to be an astronaut, what was the response to that? Uh, well, I, I, sort of, I tethered it a bit. I, I said, you know, I'd like to be, you know, I'd like to do something in space. I'd like to be a space scientist or something like that. Because I was in the remedial class, and um, they generally said, oh, Maggie, that's a nice idea, but, you know, it's probably not for you. Um, now, now, nursing, now, that's scientific. You know, why don't you go into nursing? Now, I know some fantastic nurses, but that just wasn't for me. That's not where my heart was. That's not what made my heart sing. But I think I'm the sort of person that when someone says, oh, you can't do that, I think, <laughs> I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> so, so despite the 13 schools, I, I think 
it was just that that, that crazy dream. And wow. I think that's the thing, and obviously with the work that you do, Emery, what's so important what we say to children about what they can do. Because I had a teacher, I went to a school in Dagenham, it wasn't um we weren't expected to be high achieving. Yes. Um, I was the first person in my family who went to university and that's probably very common for lots of children. But we had a teacher called Miss Banks and she just told us at seven and eight and nine, we could do whatever we wanted to. Yeah. And she used astronaut as an example. And she said, if you choose that now, you can make decisions along the way that you get you there. Opportunities. And, yes, and you go, yes. the first thing is, let's make sure you practice your maths and your science because you have to know those things. And the next decision, and I think that's such a powerful thing. Just saying that you can do it. There's, yeah. there's ways of getting around this. The power of the crazy dream. not there for you. Did you always know what you wanted to do, Anne-Marie? No. I still don't know what I want to do, <laughs> yeah. to be honest. Yeah. I think for me, it changed every three years. But I always remember doing... Um, so when I was younger, we had this thing called Connections that was amazing because you got discounts and then there's also kind of loads of careers advice. And I did this um, survey and it was like, you know, do you want to work outside? No. Do you want to have to move around? No. You know, all those kinds of things. <laughs> um, and at the end, it said you should either be a management consultant or a systems analyst. And I'd never heard of a management consultant or met one before. But it said, it was really handy, it said how much they earned. And I was like, tick. Um, <laughs> but also explain what they did. And I distinctly remember at 13 being like, hey, I could be a management consultant for Sainsbury's and then I'd get free like groceries yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that would be amazing yeah. and then it said as well um, at that point you're 16 times more likely to become a management consultant if you go to Oxford and so I was like okay this is it I'm going to do that and I'm going to get the free groceries yes. and all the money <laughs> And so that was what I wanted to do at 13. I, I don't think you can just steal groceries from Sainsbury's if you're working there as a management consultant. For, for me, at that point, it was like, if I work there, then it's almost like you work there yeah, kind of thing. And, just be just like, and then you get out, discounted like, groceries. Yeah, yeah, yeah discounted or something. Yes, yeah. But it was like, you know, I'm one of you. Yeah, that kind of, so, and then I kind of spend my money on other things, not yeah. the groceries. So you went to Oxford in order to be a management consultant. By and that point, happened? it changed a little bit. So at 16, because it changes every three years. So at 16, I realised I could be a management consultant for bankers in technology because yeah. I did an internship. Free money. Exactly, right? <laughs> <laughs> Those are good perks. That's it, right? <laughs> Lots of money. Clever. And, and funnily enough, I was paid. I was paid an intern. Well, I did my internship at 16 and I had four figures in my bank account for the first time, like, ever. And I was like, I'm definitely coming back to do this. Yeah. Um, and it was technology and being paid that much to do technology. And I, I would do the technology for free, to be honest. So that was amazing, and then it just kept changing, and still now I don't, I don't know yet what I want to do. Is STEMETS your major role now? It's my main role, yes, yeah, STEMETS, and then I speak, so I do keynote speaking, and then I get tied into like policy stuff every now and then. People ask me questions about things for laws and stuff. So can you tell us a little bit more about STEMETS? Because what you're doing is quite tied in, because you're doing a television show for children, to get them to be inspired by science. I also go out and speak to her. I think I've seen 350,000 kids in the last 12 years. <laughs> so, what? Kids. <laughs> what, personally? You've pl- She's you've winked played... at all of them. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone had a personal wink. <laughs> My eyes are a bit sore, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you haven't. She hasn't winked at children. <laughs> oh, oh, I have. <laughs> I'm going to get Maggie in trouble. It's coming over a bit creepy now, isn't it? I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Put the microphone away. (laughs) But you're both doing something that's incredible because you're inspiring the next generation and we desperately need this generation coming up because I think they're going to save the world should it last long enough for them to save it because I'm very concerned about climate change that the UN have now said if we don't slow it in the next 12 years, it's unslowable. Mm. Do you think that's true as scientists? I know that might not be your area, but do you think we're going to get there with climate change? Do you think this next generation will get to take the world over? So I think the next generation will inherit it, but what sort of world will they inherit? I think that perhaps the next generation are more clued up but we might have made such a mess that it, there's no going back. Mm. And that's the problem. The clock is ticking on climate change. And it's a long time from them being children to being kind of the government. Charge, yeah. which, and that's where it needs to happen. Do you think we'll have to go and live on other planets? And in which case, can I come with you? Because I feel like you are going to be in the right. inside now. And can we go, if we are going to go to another planet, can we be wearing those astro corsets? <laughs> This is the constellation. We'll use this as navigation. Oh, wow. It's like a sat-nav. It's like a sexy (laughs) sat-nav. So how do we inspire them? Because you guys really do know that. How do we inspire this next generation? The Stemets formula has been that um, we've got the three Fs. So everything we do is free for the girls to attend. It's always fun and there's always food. Because people like free food. It's just music to my ears. Is it provided by Sainsbury's? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> no, but it no. should be yeah, if you're be. listening. Sainsbury's. Yeah. Um, yeah, they've had a lot of airtime. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. And good all good yourself. other supermarkets and the rest of it. Um, yeah. So that's our formula because we're trying to take in the girls who don't know that they might enjoy STEM or aren't aware of the capacity for that to be a vehicle for change. And so for us, we kind of pull them in on that basis and we give them things that are very creative and very altruistic to work with. If it's building apps, if it's designing roller coasters or whatever it might be. Designing roller coasters? Yeah. See, I could get on board with that. (laughs) See, I think when I was a kid, science wasn't taught very well. I didn't have very good science or math teachers. And the one year that I did have a good math teacher... I did really well, but the rest of my time I did terribly because I just couldn't understand it. I couldn't get into it. I was very bright at humanities and I just sort of withdrew from it and I really Mm. wish I'd had better teachers. Which is is common with all children. It's much easier to enjoy something if you think you're good at it and it's very, Mm, very hard when you you tell yourself, that's why what we get told by society is also very important, but you tell yourself, I can't do it. So you Mm. just sit there going, ugh. I don't, yeah. I don't mm. understand. Yeah, I withdraw from the race. Yeah, I'm not even going to engage. I was told I was remedial in maths quite early and I was told I was sort of uber bright in English. They used to read my stories out on my creative writing out to the rest of the class as a sort of example. Mm. And I was told I could be a published writer, but I was also told... I was in the terrible class. You know, I was in the sort of... I don't, I don't think they officially called it the terrible class. <laughs> yes. But it was terrible set class. nine. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, for maths. Now, yeah. And so I just thought, well, I'm not good at this, so I'll just withdraw from that. I'm not good at it anyway, so it doesn't matter. I'll make it... I, I will lower the value of it. Mm. Because if I'm not good at something, it's stupid and doesn't matter. Mm. You know, I'll put my, my value eggs in this basket over here. Can I just ask, STEM, in case anyone doesn't know, STEM stands for? Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths. Science, Technology, Engineering, Maths. Sometimes you have STEAM as well, Science, yeah. Technology, Engineering, Arts and Maths. Because they do, all, they do all fit together. As well. yeah. Yeah. They've got arts in there. It's like superpowers yeah. all together. Yeah. 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 Can I be arts? Well, I'll be the A. <laughs> yeah. and, and all of them. The idea is to kind of be on the spectrum with, of, with all, all of them. them. Yeah. And and I, pick and choose. What I would like is to come over to your house. And I want you to teach me science and maths. Mm. And, She's and busy. Tech. She's busy. It's <laughs> just said it was all for a new generation. Come to the events. You you to the events. Yeah. Yeah, I know, but I do. Sense. I kind of feel like I would be drawn into your world. I know you don't have the actual time to teach me, but I feel like if you were my teachers, I would be good at this and I would see the value of it and I would understand more than I do. That's my frustration, though, because I think it's one of those things where it's a system, right? And systems can't work for everybody. But math is one that math and science is, maybe because of the way they're taught, probably because of the way that the curriculum is put together, which you kind of alluded to earlier. We don't have this creativity in it, but we also don't have people able to learn in the ways that they learn. So with math, there's so many different ways to solve any problem. Mm -hmm. And you being taught that that is the way you must multiply Mm -hmm. works for the people who think that way, but not for the people that don't. I think it must be very difficult with the parents as well, because if the people at home don't understand maths Mm -hmm. or also were told they were bad at it and can't do it, Mm -hmm. and obviously the same thing happens with reading, but I think it's more common that people will read with their children, don't think I... But yes. the stigma is different as well yes. for reading, right? So yeah. we can all laugh and say, I'm, I'm rubbish at maths. Yeah. But, you know, God forbid you say that about English yeah, or reading. Yeah, you can't reading. say, I, I can't read. Yeah. yeah. But That's so true, say, yeah. isn't it? Mm, yeah. Really if true. you can't read, it feels like society will shame you. But if mm. you can't add up, it's hilarious. Mm. <laughs> in this society. <laughs> and also, yeah, in our society. Yeah, politicians yeah. say, oh, 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 I know nothing about science, quite proudly. Yeah. And yeah. they should yeah. be embarrassed. Yeah. But, the, but I think with science and, and with mathematics, it truly, I think it hinges more on the teacher than other subjects. Mm. And so if you have a sort of a teacher who's sort of dynamic and brings it to life, then kids are engaged. But if you have a teacher who doesn't sort of... A, a, and also, many of the teachers teaching subjects like physics aren't actually physicists. It's sort of like a, a tag on to their sort of a, a, their curriculum and they have to teach physics. So they feel just sort of one step ahead of the pupils and I, I think that makes it it's hard to be inspiring when you're, you're sort of trying to catch up at yourself yeah. my friend Hayley was teaching maths A level at Havering College and um, she was supposed to be teaching media studies yeah. and she, she was having to learn the sums at home yes before and, and the then, day before and then hope that no one asked a question wow see, it's hard to be inspirational like that yeah, <laughs> yeah. when you're terrified trying to remember what you're supposed to be yeah. doing yeah. yeah so with Stamet you're trying to get this next generation of girls to come in engage do tech create things design things have a snack have a snack exactly Important. thank you Sarah yes. have a snack. Yeah. and make it a playful female space 
that they feel they own. That they feel they own, and normally we do it at tech companies and engineering companies. So it's a physical space that they can feel very comfortable in, and they do get very comfortable, but also where we can almost suspend reality for them a little bit. Yeah. So if they've come to that hackathon and they've built something and they've really enjoyed themselves and they've won a prize, then if they go back to school and the boys are like, oh, girls don't do that, well, they can be a bit like, well, yeah. this weekend I was with 70 other girls and we're all building it and yeah. I actually won a prize. So actually, yeah. girls can do this and I did do this. Have you had any pushback? because I think often it happens when you're trying to create a space to help girls mm. the then thing is well what about all the boys that are failing what about all the, did you get much of that I do and I always say to people be the change you want to see mm. like I only have 24 hours in the day in seven days at the moment and so <laughs> I have to <laughs> <moment. laughs> I'm working so we're we working physics, on it right yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. that's, 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 the, that's the time physics, I have yeah. and to be honest I think <laughs> the boys need something different they also need their own safe space and that's yeah. true I think with some technical kind of organisations that run like this the boys safe space is the norm is the mm. default mm. if you go to other coding clubs it is all boys and we get yeah. girls coming being like I don't want to sit with those boys every yeah. week yeah. or every weekend yeah. doing this I actually want to sit and just yeah. enjoy myself with others so we do get pushback mm. um, sometimes the boys that would need encouraging and it, you're not trying to go and we don't care about boys or we want them to do worse because it's mm. un it's not that it's going they probably need a very different thing because mm. they're being told a different thing by society mm. yeah and actually when I go out to schools I speak to <laughs> actually not just schools I speak to anyone I can taxi drivers no one is safe <laughs> 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 It's a trick because I, I think um, it, it is a societal change that we need. Because mm. I must admit, when I first started, I was sort of working as a space scientist. What you know, was pretty cool, but I couldn't understand why I couldn't recruit anyone. And so I decided I would go out and go to girls' schools and speak to girls there. But it turns out that girls are more likely to study physics in an all-girls school than they are in mixed schools. Mm. So then I started going out to mixed schools and just having sort of general. So I like to have a few sort of you know, hooks for the girls, but I speak to anyone. But then I realised if I speak to a girl at a school and she goes home and, and her dad says, oh, yeah, girls don't do that. <laughs> I don't know why they've got that accent. But anyway, girls don't do that. <laughs> then they're likely to... So I like to try and speak to anyone and show them the wonder of science and show that science truly is for everyone mm. because I think that engages everybody and people are aware of how science is changing our lives. Mm. Have you got either a female scientist that inspires you or a scientific discovery that you think we might not know about that you could share with us? One of the problems is lack of role models. Mm. And so one of the things that I do is sort of we train women experts. There was this horrible situation where I think it was Radio 4 and they had two experts and they were both male and they were talking about the pain of childbirth. And you think, no, that is just oh. so wrong on so many levels. And so we, know we need more women sort of on, on, on doing things like this and sort of on, on radio and so getting out there. And so we train women to do this and we train sort of female scientists and they come along and they say, well, you know, what I'm doing is a bit boring, but I'm doing this. I'm so, Oh my God, you're changing the world and you don't realise it. And so, yeah, I get a sort of a, a regular update, a, amazing things going on out there. Science in general, but especially women doing amazing things. But sometimes they just take it for granted. I think two, so I'll, I'll say two because I will. Um, the first one um, is Hedy Lamarr, who, um, and her story for me is always incredible. There's a film out about her life called Bombshell, but she was this Hollywood actress who Betty Boop, many of you will recognise or know, that was kind of modelled on her. Mm. Um, and she was a physicist kind of casually, uh, you know, alongside her Hollywood uh, career, as you do. As you do. Um, <laughs> casually. Um, and so she invented something or co-invented something called frequency hopping spread spectrum technology, which physicists in the house will know what that is. The rest of you may have heard of a thing called Wi-Fi. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Or Bluetooth, so kind of wireless communication. That's the technology that underpins yeah. it. And her, her story I always, always frustrates me because I'm like, everyone loves Wi-Fi. Like, Wi-Fi is on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs now. It's something we all need. Yeah. But no one ever goes, you know, when you connect to Wi-Fi, no one ever goes, oh, thank Hedy, it's working. <laughs> yeah. You know, which we should do. And the second one is um, Stephanie Shirley. For me, the reason why I love her story or what frustrates me about her is the 1960s. So I wasn't alive in the 1960s. But when people tell me about the 1960s, they're always talking about like the swinging 60s and Twiggy and the mini and like short dresses. But meanwhile, in the 60s, Stephanie Shirley, who then went by the name Steve Shirley, um, was running this tech company of British women at their kitchen tables, you know, doing maths and coding things kind of distributed at a time when she couldn't have opened a bank account without her husband's yeah. um, yeah. permission, all this kind of stuff. And so she built this tech company that wrote um, the flight receiver for Concorde, which is like the black box for Concorde, did all this stock control software, bus timetables, like kind of everything. They kind of powered Britain. And she had to sell up her company because she'd been hiring only women. And when the Equal Opportunities Act came in, then obviously she was discriminating the opposite way, um, which I guess you can't do. Yes. And, 
kind of wasn't the point of the law. But anyway, and so she had to shut shop. But she's still alive. She's still here. She lives out in Newbury. Yeah. And she's incredible yeah. when you meet her. But it's like, why does no one ever talk about that yeah. in the 60s? Why is she not part of of our kind of lexicon. Interestingly, she had to change her name to Steve so that they could let her into meetings and then she'd be like, ha ha, I'm Steve. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which worked and kind of they made loads of money. Um, and the Queen knows who she is because she's like got all the stuff from the Queen but none of the rest of us do. So fortunately, they're doing the movie about her life now. Wow. Um, really? Which I'm really excited about. Bring her on the podcast. You should bring her. <laughs> the third one I will say, and I was talking about this earlier, talking about kind of erasure and black women in particular in this field is Gladys West. Mm -hmm. And her story really, really frustrates me because, and I will call them out, and I don't know if this is going to be litigious, so hopefully we'll make it in. I don't know. I'm currently in like an email battle mm -hmm. with them. Okay. There's a prize that goes out every year for kind of big discoveries in engineering and you get a million pounds if you've made something engineering-wise that's kind of changed the world. This year, it went to the people that made GPS. And Gladys West... <laughs> What was the gasp? I know. Spoiler <laughs> alert. Somebody, they haven't checked. Oh. Yeah, somebody's on the same page as you, I think. It's a spoiler. No, it came out like three weeks ago. Yeah, I've been no, no, she just means she's just... Oh, she's, oh she the, just realised, sorry. Is hey, what you're thanks saying. for gasping. Because um, <laughs> it is this... And uh, so, yeah, for GPS. And so someone put it out on Twitter and I was like, oh my God, is Gladys in the country? And they were like, no, it's Bob... Dave, Clive and Greg or whatever that we've given this to and I was like how is that even possible that you've not even thought to, you know, how is erasure happening in front of our eyes in 2019 mm. and you don't see fit to kind of reward her for any of her work which has really, 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 really annoyed me but Gladys West, she's now on the wall in our office fantastic mm. mathematician, anytime you're lost, Google Maps, some of you may have heard of that before um, loads of other things to applications with GPS. Yeah. She's the reason why we know where you are. And she's still alive. Why does she need to die before we and can recognise who she is or celebrate her? I Shout out to Gladys if you're listening. Yeah. 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 <laughs> when disaster strikes, women and children are... 14 times more likely to die than men. What? Are you serious? How can that be? Gender-based violence is multiplied. Thousands and thousands and thousands of women go missing. Families are willing to give away their daughters. I had to die and accept what they're doing to me. And I was just 14. Cutting the UK's foreign aid budget means thousands of women in Africa will die. Welcome to Media Storm, the news podcast that starts with the people who are normally asked last. This week's investigation, Women in Crisis, is conflict and disaster sexist. Are you ready for some stand-up on science? <laughs> then please welcome to the stage the wonderful Sarah Pascoe! <laughs> it's really interesting thinking about science and sex. When this topic came up, I was thinking not just about the sex of scientists, but just um, how much... No, no, not, and also not that meaning of sex. So don't... Um, but, but no, but the fact that science is teaching us so much about sex. All of us were taught at school that there were two sexes, and um, that's wrong, but we've all kind of grown up in this binary world, split in a certain way. And what I think is really interesting about finding out the huge range of intersex, how much bigger it is than certainly I had ever realised, and also that there isn't any definition of sex that's true of everyone. There isn't anything that you could say is male or is female. Everyone is on this spectrum. And, and the thing about science is that it doesn't kind of have a morality. It's information. And it feels like science sometimes knows things much earlier than people. So I'm a cis woman and... Um, I've always been identified as female and called a woman. And um, sometimes... Uh, Something you have to question in your own life is if you are helping enough. You, sometimes you think, oh, I'm not one of the bad people. I'm not making it worse. And um, the example I was thinking of was um, there are people that don't think that trans women should use the same toilets as other women. And it's really tricky. And the argument that they use, they, they act like they're trying to protect cis women. They act um, as if there's something inherently about the, the male body that's inherently dangerous. It's like they have never been in a toilet. Like they... Um, like, <laughs> 
Like, anyone can go in. Like, anyone <laughs> at all. Like, if a bad person wants to wait for you in the toilets, they can. Like, there isn't a force field. There isn't a bouncer checking birth certificates. Like, and I don't want to scare you about going into the toilets. <laughs> but if a bad person wants to do something, they can. Like, um, if you are scared, I've come up with an idea. Um, if you are scared in the toilets, all you have to do when you go, whatever you're doing, just do a little bit of it in your hand. And then, um, and then come out of the stall, pop your head round, check, the, check it safe, and then you can um, wash it. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so this is my thing. I was trying to work out what do we do as a cis woman, how do I make it better? And I thought the first thing we need to do, cis women, we need to be creepier in toilets. Uh, we need to make sure it isn't a safe space for anybody. We need, need to do that um, for the team. And, um, or maybe even actually just the holding the toilet in your... That might be enough, actually, the hand thing. Um, also, I just don't think that gender... Like, this, the male or female, I don't think that's a good divide. I don't think it's the appropriate divide for toilets. I think it should be vegan and non-vegan. Um, because none of us want to smell what the others are up to. And so that makes a huge amount more sense. The other thing... And actually, I don't know how much science can help me with this, but it's another thing that's been on my mind. I was reading an article about white women appropriating black women especially young women, there's a, the language and body shape and fashion. And my first thought, while I obviously understand the problem inherent in that, is that um, it's because black women are incredibly cool. And then I realised white women aren't. We are... <laughs> so when did that happen? When did white women become so uncool? Was it when that lady threw a cat in a bin? <laughs> uh, what was the point? What happened? Was it when Daniela Westbrook's nose fell off? I mean, like, hang on. Theresa May's dancing was the nail in the coffin. <laughs> We're done. We're done. I don't know how we could... She even... Theresa May has even ruined power for us. Like, the one thing you have as an oppressor is... Uh, and she just makes it look so terrible. <laughs> she looks like... She looks like anxiety personified. Like, say what you like about Donald Trump. At least it looks like he's having a laugh. <laughs> Theresa May. There are people who disagree with everything, every decision she's ever made politically, but they'd still put a fiver in if I said we were kind of clubbing together to send her to a day spa. Um, <laughs> Um, oh, well, women my age, I'm nearly 40, women my age, I haven't noticed any of my friends appropriating black culture. What I have noticed is they're appropriating drag queens, which is very ironic because... Um, they're appropriating all the stuff we didn't want when we were growing up. Like, when we were growing up, we didn't want to have too much makeup. We wanted to be natural. We didn't want restrictive underwear and uncomfortable shoes. And then gay men took it and they put glitter all over the patriarchy and now we want it back. Um, <laughs> and it is, it's gay men. Straight men, fascinatingly, it's the, the, uh, the biggest growing industry in cosmetics is straight men buying lotions, but they're tricking you into thinking it's manly because they're putting sandalwood in it. <laughs> and you're just like, no, 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 it's not a lotion. It smells like a shed. And, um, and I just think it's so adorably wrong. Like, if you're trying to attract women, don't smell like a shed. We're scared of spiders. Um, if you want to attract straight women, you want to smell like something we like, um, true crime podcasts. It's the only thing all straight women like. If you want, just make your face smell like a, a very detailed description of another woman's brutal murder. And we'll be all over you like a rash. Thank you so much. Is there anything you haven't said that you would like to say? Is there anything you'd like to leave on the... I've got a new podcast out. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, yeah, we will definitely do plugs. Okay. But is there anything else about women in science? <laughs> <laughs> She's a woman in science. Yes. Yes. My podcast yes. is about women in science. Everything else um, you've got to say will be in your no, podcast. No, my producer was like, you're going on. You're like, look, 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 make sure you mention it. I never no, no, mention yeah, anything I'm supposed will. to mention. You, you absolutely will. So before we do plugs, is there yes. anything else about women in science yes. or science in general or feminism in science you want to say? I reckon it's about role models. Because when I go out to school, it's, again, a three-pronged attack. And I like to show them sort of role models, women in science, working in science. I like to show them a sort of a, what you can do with a career in science. And I show them the wonder of science. But it's the role models that are the challenge. When someone first said I was a role model, I thought, yeah, you're mad. You're pathologically late. I'm stupidly untidy. How could I possibly be a role model? And so, but I realised that role models don't have to be perfect. Role models just have something to be really excited about. And I get really excited about science. And so when I go and speak to the female experts, I want... Every 
everybody to be a role model, especially women in science. And so go and sort of to my daughter's school and go out there and tell them about what you're doing. Because generally speaking, what we're doing blows my socks off. And I think we can blow other people's socks off too. Yeah. Also, the message is that we are all role models because we don't have to be on that platform. We don't have to be, we just have something to share. So each and every one of us should be getting out. I like to call it going out and showing your shiny bits. It sounds slightly rude, but I think we should all be doing it. <laughs> yeah. Motivation by association. association. And the desire to aspire. That's what many girls need. The desire to aspire. The desire to aspire. What I will say, maybe controversially, maybe not, a lot of people in the audience today and people that might be, I hope under 18s aren't listening to this because we've been swearing a fair amount. Um, Many of you might actually be in industry. I don't do anything for women that are already in industry um, or to the women, sorry, that are already in industry. My thing is we need to change the other people and the kind of culture that goes on around them. So when I do the keynote speaking, I'm always trying to kind of help other people be better allies and make nudges on the culture. Because Change the power structures rather than the people, constantly Because the problem telling, is not with the women. The problem yeah. is not with the women. It's with everyone else who's, who's effectively forcing them out and pushing them out. For whatever reason it might be. Maybe they don't know about Gladys or Hedy or anyone else. But my thing is always, look, just don't... Used to be, don't be a douche. But now it's become, look for the small things. So the example I give is NASA, uh, ESA, sorry, a couple of years ago had a mission to Mars, a um, Rosetta mission. And um, there was this dude that turned up on BBC Breakfast to talk on behalf of the ESA. And it all went viral for the wrong reasons because he turned up in this awful shirt oh, I know that had like na- half naked yes. women on it. Oh, yeah. And I always tell people that story. And I'm like, got to think, like, we've got to think of how we got there with him doing that. Firstly, he bought the shirt. And no one was like, hey, maybe that's not a shirt you might want to own yeah. or wear at one point. He then wore the shirt and no one said, don't have that on. He wore the shirt out of the house and no one stopped him on the way, right? That's another, we've got three opportunities now to stop that happening where people have been like, no, no, we're just going to let it slide because oh, so how bad can it be? You're imagining friends in his life that I don't think are there. No, well, this is it, right? <laughs> Come on, it's not just friends. No, no, no. It's not just friends. Because then he got yeah. to work. And you, you might not have friends at work, but yes. there are other people at work. And no one said, huh, maybe don't wear that shirt to work. He then wore it to the studio on behalf of work. The person and minder that went with him, no one said, don't wear that shirt. The person behind the camera, the producers, no one said, hey, and you know this, you're in TV. They tell you, bring a couple of outfits because it might clash. No one said, wear the other outfits. And if he'd had like Adidas emblazoned all over him. They, they would have stopped. Yeah. But Naked yeah. Ladies is great. And so it's really funny because then it broadcasts and then someone's, you know, no, women are totally welcome in science. Just ask the dude in the shirt. And you've got to think, like, you see that guy, either you see him leaving the house, or you see him wearing the shirt to work, or you see him wearing it on camera, point it out and be like, maybe not today for that well, actually, shirt. Actually, actually, case in point, I was next to that guy and I must admit, he turned around and I said, oh, hi, um, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, the thing is, the thing is and I, but I got to know. So you could have told him to take the shirt. I could, I could. Oh, guilty oh, yeah. from the phone. Oh, Maggie, Maggie, <laughs> Maggie. <laughs> it's true, I could have. Wow. But, but it's quite interesting because on the flip side, he said that he wore the shirt because he just didn't want to be you know, the same boring old sergeant. And the thing is, he didn't buy, okay, 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 I know, I know. And then that guilty feminist coming through. But, but also, um, it, it was a made to measure shirt. And there was this shirt. Let me finish, let me finish, let me finish, let me finish. Let me finish. Wow. But he, he had a choice of two materials, and one had semi-clad women, and one had semi. Hold it, hold it, let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> one had semi-clad women, and one had semi-clad men, and he decided that the semi-clad men just really wasn't. But so he went for semi-clad women. And yes, looking back at it, I think perhaps I should have said, "Oh, you know, this is a nice Sainsbury's <laughs> style shirt." <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this was a, this is, this in Dutch in Germany. Do you know? <laughs> but they could have got one there for free. I like, know. Like, they need to pay us for this, he, but... Also, he was horribly cut up about it. Um, well, what does um, that mean? No, he, he, well, quite right, yes. But I wish you didn't tell me this, Maggie, because this story's got so much better now when I'm going to retell it. <laughs> <laughs> and she was there, and she, she didn't there. say a word. Yeah, she <laughs> was one that, that they came for the shirts with naked women on, and I said nothing. Um, <laughs> Guys, feminist. guys, we've got to get out of here. Maggie, what have you got to plug? Uh, I've got um, a book um, that's just came out all about the moon. It's called The Sky at Night Book of the Moon. And it's about science of the moon. and the old, But it's about art and poetry and about my love affair with the moon because I am a self-certified lunatic. So hey, <laughs> I'll get that out there. The literal <laughs> sense of the word. 
And Anne Marie, anything to plug? Uh, I've got I a new you're doing a podcast. Out. Yes, there we go. <laughs> uh, with the evening standard called Women Tech Charge, and the first episode's out on Monday, 4th of March, and I'm Ooh. interviewing a deputy director at GCHQ. Wow. Yeah. So well, you um, can't so see her face, but you can hear her voice. <laughs> well, send us a little clip from it, and we'll trail it we'll on do. The Guilty Feminist Thank you. to try and direct our listeners to you, because we should all know more about science. I should know more about science, so I will certainly be listening. And also, we'll tune into your children's show if we have children. <laughs> which is called um, CBB's Stargazing. St- CBB's st- yeah. CBB's it's it's Stargazing. Adorable. CBB's it's, it's you cosmology your for 47 year olds. <laughs> your dog mouse would enjoy that. I know. He's too mine. young to even entertain how large the cosmos is. <laughs> <laughs> A huge round of applause and thank you to the Science Museum. <laughs> thank you guys for having us. Sorry we've overrun, but they were very entertaining. And in our defence, we wasted a lot of time talking nonsense earlier. Um, A big round of applause to the wonderful Dr Anne-Marie Imaphodon. And Dr Maggie Adder and Pocock. And my co-pilot for the scene is Sarah Pascoe. Incredible set for Francis White. Thank you very much. We've been the Guilty Feminists. Good night. Can you do one thing and then listen to a podcast? Yeah. No, <laughs> no you can't, but you just... you just, Ish. Yeah. Ish. Okay, good. All right, all right. Can, sack, so. You haven't got the sack? Yeah, so... But if that doesn't prove <laughs> that your work is excellent, then <laughs> what that, will... That's Theresa May's in a monologue at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's going to really be that bad. <laughs> R- rough enough is good enough. Yeah. It's Brexit. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.